Hi, I'm Stephanie Brantz. Well, with Australia set to take on England in their bid to regain the Ashes, we thought it might be fun to step back in time and look at some of the memorable Ashes tests between the old enemies. Five tests were played in the 1958-59 Ashes series against what was on paper one of the strongest English sides ever to tour Australia. Having won the previous three series in 1953, in 54-55 and then again in 56, they looked likely to retain the famous urn. But Richie Benno hadn't read that script. The Australian captain had one of his greatest triumphs in winning the series 4-0 and went on to be considered one of the greatest captains of all time. We pick up the action with edited highlights of the second test and later the fourth test from the ABC series Late Night Legends. And don't forget all the action of the current Ashes tour is live on ABC local radio. But your commentator for this one is Michael Charlton. Melbourne 1958. Cool and overcast as they come out, Peter May of England and Australia's Richie Benno. The two captains were about to go through the necessary preliminaries which would set in motion the second test match. They found the 22-yard strip of turf looking at summer best and eager to appraise its behaviour were a good 30,000 experts already cramming the ground before noon. On this day, Peter May turned 29 and his birthday gift to himself and England was to call tails and decide to give his side first use of the wicket. The Australians went into this game already one up in the series after their convincing win in the first test. The team Melbourne was seeing was the same 11 which gave Australia victory in Brisbane, except for the inclusion of Bobby Simpson. All speculation about who would face them first ended with the appearance of Trevor Bailey and Peter Richardson. Bailey, the man of crisis, and Richardson, who was determined to redeem himself after a melancholy succession of failures. Ahead of these two was the task of coping with the same Australian attack they had met in Brisbane and our cameras go in for a closer look at the field Benno is setting. The wicket was green enough to favour pace bowling and the Australian captain has the speed of Alan Davidson to call upon. The brilliant all-rounder from Sydney was playing in his 19th test and so it's one left-hander about to do battle with another. Richardson now settling in and waiting for the first ball and on the last day of 1958 the second test begins with Davidson bowling to an attacking umbrella field. Again it's Davidson moving with his in-swingers helped by a brisk southerly. It's apparent that Davidson is out to exploit the batsman's weakness outside the off stump and it's from an edge which speeds away down the gully that the scoring opens. Richardson and Bailey go through for two. Still no hint, however, of the dramatic events which were soon to follow. The opening over yielded four runs and the bowling is entrusted to Ian Mekiff, the other left-hand prong of Benno's pace attack. The cautious Bailey has stepped into the breach as an opener, as he did on his previous tour of Australia. And here comes a ball from Mekiff which he finds to his taste. It's sent away for a couple and England goes on to seven. Everything's going on serenely. No heads have toppled, but the tumbrils soon have a passenger. Richardson faces Davidson. There's an edge, a catch behind, and the Worcestershire batsman is on his way back. He made only three. Richardson, who had once again fallen victim to a ball swinging away outside his off stump. And there were pats on the back in the Australian camp, notably for Wally Grout and his safe pair of gloves. Which brings to the wicket another left-hander, Willie Watson. Benno certainly didn't have defence in mind with such a field, nor did Alan Davidson, who had once again broken through England's openers, and is now about to send down the fifth ball of a memorable over. The pressure was right on, and the man who'll feel its weight is the doomed Watson. That's why the camera saw that fifth ball from Davidson, a fast Yorker. Watson was gone and the score hadn't budged. Natural jubilation here, the two men were out for only seven. Tom Graveney we saw appearing then on the scene at a time when the Australians were indisputably on top. And with that knowledge, the Gloucestershire batsman made ready to parry the onslaught. So it's another ball from Davidson and the batsman is trapped in front of his wicket. 
which had the strikes of cricket unleashing a state of adjectives in praise of Davidson, which brought a worried Peter May out to bat and a storm of applause for Alan Davidson. Mackay of Queensland bowls to May. If England ever needed a captain's innings from him, it was now. Three wickets had tumbled for seven runs. Harsh facts for a skipper who wasn't all that comfortable himself in the early stages of his innings. His was a classic fighting knock, and here's a sample of the work he was to give the Australian fieldsman before this day was out. Slowly, very slowly, the score was mounting after a calamitous start. Bailey was picking up some runs here and there and seemed to be revelling in the sort of situation in which he so often found himself. By lunch, he and May had put on 48, but the board still didn't make very happy reading for England. Three for 28 was Davidson's booty so far, and his figures suffer somewhat just after the interval when a beautiful square cut by May sends the batsman racing through for three. The temperature had now soared into the 80s, and the crowd to 50,000, as we find May awaiting a new over from his Australian opposite number. Captain takes a single off Captain, a most grudgingly conceded single, and the score is creeping along. Both batsmen seem to be set for a big partnership, and Benno found little response from the pitch to his spinners. He's about to come in for some punishment at the hands of Bailey, who really gets on to that one, and far out in the country, there's some work for Mackay. This was a vastly different Bailey from the Bailey of Brisbane, and there goes a repeat dose, a real scorcher which could end up nowhere but the fence. <laughs> Benno now has something to ponder. These two batsmen were making a bold bid to pull the game around. They've already added 72, which became 76 with a Bailey sweep to leg, and the only man who needed to do any running was Queensland's Ken Mackay. One can merely conjecture about what May was saying to Bailey and what Bailey was saying to May, but clearly they had reason to be pleased with England's recovery so far. At this point, Benno decided to call on Meckett, the speedster whose bowling action caused quite a controversy this season. May apparently reddishes his return to the attack and sends Klein away in vain pursuit. Then Richie Benno tries again, the batsman Bailey, who hands out some further vigorous treatment. <laughs> Melbourne enjoyed what it was seeing, liked the brand of strokes which May and his partner were turning on. Runs were now flowing steadily from both bats as England continued to recover from her early setbacks. So, Mekif to Bailey, and the Essex all-rounder goes on to within two of his half-century. This was the first time that television had ever taken a test match into Australian homes, and the telecast began in good time for the next flurry of excitement. Here it comes now. Benno holds the catch, and Bailey's fine innings has finished. With May, Bailey had helped to put on 85 sorely needed runs, and the C is for Cowdery, who made a century in the Melbourne test on the previous tour. The advent of this great Kent batsman means that both the England captain and vice-captain are in together. And we concentrate for a moment on Peter May and the crashing drive which brings up his 50. <laughs> Runs are coming freely both from spinners and the pace men. Peter May has seldom been in better touch and has an effective answer to everything that's bowled. He and Cowdery are the last of the recognised batsmen and they're stepping up the tempo. Cowdery has made 10, and the board shows they've already put on 32. Then, for the first time this match, Benno brings Klein into the firing line, and England's captain, helped by the agile Cowdery, sends it speeding off to the boundary. A tired but a pretty happy Peter May can take solace in the fact that since lunch, England has added 73 precious runs and this single makes it 74 for the loss of only one wicket. Four for 129, 
England's position on this first day as they make ready to resume after the tea break. The Australian captain decides to persevere with his spinners and May's reply is a May classic. That boundary prompts Benno to tighten his bowling and May weather the remainder of a particularly good over. In all, May was playing a safe yet enterprising innings, first with Bailey, now with Cowdery, who faces up to Davidson. The Kent batsman picks up some runs, and the chase is Norman O'Neill's concern. There's a zest to Cowdery's batting, which shows he's nearing the form expected of him. That four took him to 17, took Jim Burke to the boundary, and brought Sydney's Alan Davidson running in again. Cowdery sees some runs in it, and proceeds to get them. That made the may Cowdery stand worth 52. A bowling chain sees the left-arm spinners of Klein given the May treatment. It netted three runs both for him and for England. With the end of the day in sight, the main point of interest was whether the England captain would go for the runs in an effort to get his century before stunts. Neither Klein nor Benno got much response from the Melbourne wicket, which was said to be the best prepared there since the war. Both batsmen went back into their shells during the closing minutes of play. There were still some hoping for a breakthrough, but the day was ending on a fairly quiet note, with May still going along nicely, yet making no attempt to hurry on to his century. That, obviously now, would have to wait, to the disappointment of those who had stayed on. Play was over for the day, and both May and Cowdery remained unbeaten. Alan Davidson's spell of inspired bowling was among the highlights of a day which ended with England well back into the picture, four for 173 at stumps on the first day. The film story of the second test match continues next morning, with Klein getting some early punishment at the hands of Cowdery. This day, New Year's Day, 1959, saw Colin Cowdery turning on his best performance of the tour so far. This was his second boundary from successive balls, and Melbourne was liking it. Klein's partner in spin, Benno, could do little to curb them, and this single to May took the England captain to 98. The chilly day, meanwhile, is no way matched the lusty warmth of Cowdery's mood, and the score goes merrily ahead. This was a moment of cricket history. The bowler is Klein, the batsman May. And there's no mistaking it, Peter May has just become the first English captain to notch up a century in Australia for more than 50 years. A comforting sight for England after such a disastrous start, and there seems no holding May now. Power and impeccable timing sent another ball racing off to the fence. That takes the score past 200 and brings Ian Meckiff back into the attack, bowling with a new ball. But May is in splendid form and gets one away to square leg for a couple. But a magnificent innings is about to end. Meckiff bowls to May. Peter May had batted for five hours in knocking up his third century in tests against Australia, a truly fighting innings which the home side isn't sorry to see at an end. England's fifth wicket has fallen, and the huge holiday crowd sees an old friend and adversary at the batting end, wicketkeeper Godfrey Evans. That boundary was the only scoring shot Evans could manage, and from this next ball he spooned up the easiest of catches to Davidson. Meckett has taken his third wicket, an equal share with Davidson, who's destined to send Cowdery back to the pavilion. The left-hander comes in, there's an edge, and wicketkeeper Grout holds the catch. The backbone of the England batting has now been broken, but the Surrey bowler, Jim Laker, helps give the tail a handy wag. 
These are two of the 41 which the last three batsmen were to put on before the last of them was out of the way. Again, it's Alan Davidson. The response wasn't perhaps in the Peter May idiom, but it did bring another run at a time when Australia badly needed to put a halt to the scoring. There were a few batting niceties from either batsman, Tony Locke in this case, yet the runs didn't cease to flow, mainly in ones and twos. Lunch was only minutes away, in all some 60,000 appetites. They get some free sandwich satisfaction when Richie Benno comes on. Locke is batting, he's tempted from his crease, and the bales are off. And here's how things stood at lunch. The morning's play had yielded 60 runs, soon to be enhanced by some real later elegance, elegant enough to clinch another three for England. Jim Laker's resistance was more than mere nuisance value. He was knocking up runs. So too was Statham. But their spree was short-lived. And for those who thrive on wickets toppling, here's one now. It's Davidson to Statham. Watch the stumps. Statham's departure means that England have only one man to come, Peter Loder. He goes through the normal preliminaries, scores one run, and that's all, because it's Davidson loping in, his target, the stumps. England were out for 259. Jim Laker remained unbeaten with 22, and Alan Davidson had finished with the grand bowling figures of 6 for 46. The opening chapter of the second test match in Melbourne was over. England has just over two and a half centuries tucked safely, and it's a rather hushed and certainly expectant crowd now settling down to see Australia's reply. Lancashire's Brian Statham is on his way in, and Colin MacDonald makes it clear that he's not only seeing them, but is also keen to get the score moving and keep it that way. The speed attack was being met very confidently, and MacDonald guides this one down the gully for the two it deserved. That brought Burke up against Loder. What the batsman achieved, and there it is, seemed to indicate that he too had made up his mind to make this an opening stand to be reckoned with. Neither batsman was even remotely in trouble, and Victorian Colin MacDonald was turning on a treat on this his home ground. Eleven were on the board with another from Statham in full swing. Australia is in for a nasty jolt. Burke knew absolutely nothing about it and is out clean bowl for only three. Burke leaves, and his place as partner for MacDonald is taken by Harvey, who we'll see in a moment. But first it's again MacDonald, and the supreme ease with which he gets Loder away through mid-wicket. Now the start of an innings deluxe from Neil Harvey, and it's Loder who gets an early taste of what's to come. Seldom has the left-hander manhandled a strong England attack with such vigour. Seldom has Melbourne seen so determined an Australian recovery after so early a setback. Solid defence wasn't lacking in his make-up either, but attack was the Harvey mood, and Bailey is due to experience the same treatment already handled out to Loder. There's a beautifully timed drive, and we follow the ball to its inevitable destination.
There was a marked quickening in tempo after the arrival of Harvey. Bailey's the bowler here, and it's mercilessly thumped away for the Australian to scamper through for a well-run three. Again it's Statham, and although MacDonald is still among the runs, he's just been overhauled by his partner. They take the score rapidly through the 30s, linger a while in the 40s against very accurate bowling, and then go past the half century. Indeed, an excellent recovery. With an hour to play and two of the best men in, Peter May calls for the sobering influence of the Laker of spinners. He too is soon trading at a loss. Harvey's on 40 and goes smartly on to 44, again at the expense of a fine bowler who found little friendship in the hard Melbourne pitch. Harvey's on 44, but only for a second because 48 is soon thumped against his name. After that boundary, Harvey took a single. Then in Lakers' next over, his half-century stood literally just around the corner. As you can see, Harvey was outstripping his partner, and that remained the pattern of events for the remainder of the day. We single out a final Harvey gem, his last glittering gesture during an afternoon which will be remembered for the sparkle he gave us. Laker to Harvey, and a quiet note to end the day's play which saw Australia on 96 for the loss of one wicket, that is 163 behind on the first innings, with nine wickets intact. The third day, the same batsmen were together at lunch, but soon afterwards Statham, off this ball, broke the partnership. McDonald gets an outside edge, and Graveney snaps up the catch. McDonald had spent over four hours at the wicket for his 47 and a stand of 126 with Harvey. That means another left-hander, right-hander pair will continue the Australian innings for O'Neill is next in. O'Neill, who had made an impressive big cricket debut in the first test at Brisbane. His first danger is Statham and he survives it. We see Tony Locke doing battle with Harvey and the artistry of a batsman who had gone into the 90s in one of the finest knocks of his cricketing career. Both he and O'Neill were thriving in the Melbourne sunshine which had followed two overcast days. And it's the Sydney batsman now facing Locke who lends his own brand of grace and goes ahead by way of the vacant outfield. Much the same ball comes along, that's O'Neill's reply, and they scuttle through for a single which very nearly wasn't worth the effort. But Harvey remains, and the Australian score continues to build up with both batsmen well on top of an accurate but tiring English attack. Spin of Laker to a Harvey on 99. He needs a single. It's taken Neil Harvey four and a half hours, and he starts unfolding some beautiful shots, all of them marked with the stamp of the truly great batsman he is. Neil Harvey's century is his fourth against England and his 17th in all test matches. And how delighted Melbourne was about it all. They had seen Australia recover from a shaky start and the board made pleasant reading for a crowd which not unnaturally had its eyes on the ashes. But the tussle goes on with Loder trying to get past Harvey's bat.
O'Neill had gladly allowed his brilliant partner to dominate the game. But now Peter Loder drops one short, which brings him vigorously back to our notice. They actually ran three, though there was no need for them to budge. These two batsmen have already put on more than a century, and Harvey now sets about Laker with a powerful sweep which can't help but go to the fence. Harvey again. O'Neill had scored 37 when Statham had him caught at the wicket and a fine partnership had ended. He had batted for nearly three hours and two left-handers were now together. With this shot, Harvey brings his side to within two runs of England's first innings total and Australia has seven wickets still standing. The two left-handers crossed twice and their partnership was to end at that. There's trouble in sight for Australia because in Loder's next over, Harvey was bowled for 167. It was Harvey's 17th century in test matches and his departure means that two wickets have just fallen for the addition of only two runs. For the first time in this series, West Australian Bobby Simpson is at the crease. He faces a Peter Loder who is eager for another kill before the new batsman gets beyond the early defensive stage of his innings. All eyes are now on Ken Mackay as he scores the run which puts Australia one ahead of England's 259. Now it's Statham to Bobby Simpson, a pretty unsure Simpson at that. But the Lancashire bowler is beaten to the punch because it's the persevering Loder who lands the wicket. Trapped right in front of the stumps, Simpson is out for a duck. This brings an abrupt change of complexion. Australia's last 12 runs cost three valuable wickets. And it's Benno trying to deal with a Peter Loder who's just sent two top batsmen back to the pavilion. No run here, but a single comes to Mackay with a turn to square leg of Statham. The single brings Benno up against Statham. Australia's captain is beaten by an inswinger, he's wrapped on the pads and is out without scoring. Benno's dismissal climaxed a sensational burst of fast bowling which put England very much back in the reckoning. All the havoc had been achieved by Statham and Loder. And another destroyer, Alan Davidson, puts things in order for his role as batsman. His ordeal involves meeting the pace of Statham. Even the batsman thinks this one might have hit the stumps, but the appeal for LBW is rejected. Ken Mackay goes comfortably along as he and his partner set about improving things. The bowler was Loder, and the sunny man now moves into a vastly happier Davidson, who gets the right ball to crack away through mid-wicket. Three to Davidson, and next a two from a taste of Davidson delicacy to the vacant territory around the corner. In their brief association, these two have already sent the score ahead by ten, and in the closing minutes, the spinners come on. Here it's locked to Mackay, and Mackay exploits the sparsely populated covers. The three they ran made their partnership worth double figures at a time when runs really meant something. They came steadily with Alan Davidson picking up a couple more as the clock moved on towards six and the close of play. The usual die-hard stayed on till stumps. With that moment in sight, the Sydney all-rounder supplied the power necessary to reach the boundary and at the same time give his side a lead of 23 runs on the first innings.
The two left-handers saw the day out. Three days remain, and it's still anyone's game. And we can merely speculate at the confidences exchanged between all-rounder and these young admirers. Saturday, the fourth day, and the Statham-Davidson clash causes quite a stir early on. The ball's edged dangerously close to Cowdery at second slip. Within seconds, Lotus retrieving it from the boundary, and the incident is over. Mackay has improved his overnight score by only four runs when he fell to a Statham swinger. The ball is bowling now. The batsman gets an edge and Evans snaps up the catch. <laughs> Ken Mackay was out for 18. Seven Australian wickets had fallen, five of them to Statham. His fellow speedster Peter Loder has taken two wickets. But he now has the unwanted distinction of being pulled away by Davidson for the two runs, which brings 300 up for Australia. A neat turn to leg by Davidson takes him to 24, but with Brian Statham operating at the other end, things are about to happen. The off stump goes cartwheeling on its doomed way. He was Statham's sixth victim, and Mecca quickly became the seventh. The bowler didn't emerge completely unscathed, however, and wicketkeeper Wally Grout had a brief moment of batting glory. That boundary took Grout's score to eight, his final gesture. Because as many more than the 50,000 at the ground can testify, the innings ended in Loder's next over. The batsman skied the ball out towards mid-on, where Peter May took the catch. <laughs> Australia made 308, and what a tribute there was for Brian Statham. He had the splendid bowling figures of seven wickets for 57. That gave Australia a first innings lead of 49. Not a very formidable lead, but a formidable ordeal begins for Peter Richardson. And he starts well as England sets about the task of wiping off the deficit. The Australian fast bowlers had to contend with an easy paced wicket, and neither of them, in this case Ian Meckiff, seemed to be troubling Bailey or his partner. England has only three on the board as Mekif bowls to Richardson. The batsman makes his fatal stroke, Harvey holds the catch, and Richardson is gone. Once again, the Australians have seized on Richardson's weakness, and Harvey's catch at second slip was the payoff. So once more, Melbourne had seen a poor start by England, and it was an elated Mekif who tackled the newcomer, Willie Watson. Watson, who made certain not to repeat his duck of the first innings. Davidson now, and little comfort for Watson, who, it'll be remembered, scored a fine century in his first test match against Australia at Lord's in 1953. Injuries plagued him early in this tour, and he's not very happy during this Melbourne crisis. Nor does Trevor Bailey much reddish, the sort of stuff coming at him from Davidson. England has no greater fighter than Bailey, and it isn't long before he's picked the one which will put him among the runs. The score was on 14 when Alan Davidson comes in with a fast Yorker which sends Watson's off stump flying. Watson had made only seven and the second wicket had fallen with England still 35 runs in arrears. Much then depended on Tom Graveney and how he handled the speed attack. He began confidently. Meanwhile Trevor Bailey was going his defiant way 
A few runs are added, but not enough, not nearly enough, as England hopes to set Australia a big score to overtake in the closing stages. Because with two wickets down, it's the tourists themselves who are still doing the chasing. So it's the tall Meckiff bowling to Gravney, and the batsman turns it to leg, starts to run, then realises that he's out. Not for nothing have Davidson's teammates nicknamed him the Claw. His catch meant England was now 3 for 21, the state of affairs which confronted Peter May as he comes out to bat. He had delighted Melbourne with a century in the first innings and his stand with Bailey had been worth 85. Now the same pair come together again with the dreary knowledge that Richardson, Watson and Graveney had been and gone. Indeed, England was in a tough spot, still 25 behind after this three of Bailey's. The attack is taken to the England captain by Davidson. The responsibilities facing May are tremendous and he needs a good score, a very big score. Meckiff to Bailey and Benno very close in at silly leg. Again it's Meckiff and he strikes another blow for Australia when Bailey skies the ball into Burke's hands. Four wickets were down for 27 runs and it had taken Meckiff's third victim an hour to score his 14. With Bailey gone, it meant that the Victorian fast bowler now had Cowdery against him. Also that England's captain and vice-captain were at the wickets together again. May and Cowdery, without question, were England's last hope of saving this, the second test match, in Melbourne. May finally gets off the mark with two runs through square leg. England were within striking distance now of Australia's score, but it had cost four good wickets in getting this far, and the experts appreciated the fight which once again Peter May had on his hands. Meckiff continues the attack, and May gets his second two, his only scoring shots up to this moment. As Ian Meckiff bowls to Cowdery, we note the scoring Cowdery shot, which gives him two and takes his score along to 12. He's apparently decided on trying to hit England out of trouble. But these proved to be Cowdery's last runs, because he was out next ball. And here's Ian Meckiff about to do the damage. What happened next happened very quickly, and wicketkeeper Grout held the catch. Five wickets gone, and England still needs five runs to draw level with Australia at which point the hard-hitting Godfrey Evans came on the scene. They passed the Australian score, and Evans greeted Benno's return to the attack with a burst of vigour. There are three runs in it, but the pattern of this match is already set. It's only a matter of when and by what margin Australia will win. A cover drive by May, whose decision to bat so late in the order seems to have been a mistake. Evans is next to go in Benno's over. The batsman tries to pierce the off field, then attempts a futile run and isn't able to regain his crease. A smart return by McDonald made the run out possible. With the score at six wickets for 57, May has lost another partner. After 14 more runs, it was May himself who went. Bowling here is Meckiff, who had already taken two wickets. May attempts a cut, and Davidson catches him brilliantly. England's captain made 17, and the cold facts were these. Only four later, the procession back to the pavilion began again. Tony Locke is facing Davidson, and the bowler himself takes the catch, which dismissed Locke for six. Grand bowling and fielding now have England hopelessly on the run and eight wickets are down to 75. And the collapse continues in Davidson's next over when Jim Laker edges a ball into the hands of the waiting Harvey. It was Harvey's second catch of the innings and Davidson's third wicket. 
England, nine for 80, as Melbourne awaits the final convulsion which ends the innings. Here it comes, Mekif to Loder, his target again, the stumps. With the exception of one over by Benno, the speed attack of Mekif and Davidson had been unchanged to rout England for 87 runs. Mekif finished with six for 38 and Davidson three for 41. This left Australia needing only 39 for an outright victory in the second test at Melbourne. This was only the third day of a six-day match. 20 minutes remained for play when Australia's second innings began. Here it's Statham to Burke. There was in fact an incident for the Saturday crowd in the closing minutes. Statham dismissed MacDonald when he trapped him leg before wicket. Australia's first wicket fell for six runs and a day of dramatic cricket was over, a day during which no fewer than 15 batsmen were dismissed. There was Sunday to think on these facts, and Monday to see a refreshed Statham bowling to Burke. He's in no way troubled, and his team is two runs nearer the target. In with Burke is the wicketkeeper Grout, who had come in as caretaker batsman late on the Saturday, and is still Burke Wistie, still opposing Statham. On 10, but Grout goes on to 12 now with one down the gully off Statham. At this stage, Australia needed less than 20 runs to become two up in the series. Wally Grout didn't survive that long because, and not unnoticed either by a long way, there came the moment when Laker tempted him forward. Evans did a neat stumping and Australia was two for 26. <laughs> 13 needed when Neil Harvey in name, became Neil Harvey in fact, facing Locke. The outcome, a three from the bat of the man who in the first innings had treated Melbourne to a delightful century. For England, the shroud of defeat is closing in and all that remains are the formalities. There are still three runs to go, and with Locke the bowler, this leeway becomes only two after Harvey goes for the corner. It's now up to Jim Burke, who, in crashing the ball to the boundary, gave Australia victory. He had made the winning hit in Brisbane, and as in Brisbane, Australia had won by eight wickets. This Melbourne test will be remembered for splendid centuries by May and Harvey and for top-class bowling by Statham, Davidson and Mekif. At two minutes to one on the fifth day, it was all over and England was two down in the series. Let's now join Michael Tarleton for the fourth test in Sydney. The city of Adelaide, January 1959, where the tall reminders of everyday work are thrust into the background by the many thousands of spectators whose thoughts centre on the possible outcome of the test match, soon to begin on this all-important wicket. With two wins to her credit, Australia needs only a draw to recover the ashes held by England since 1953. England must win to have the chance of levelling the series in the fifth and final test. This match can be the decider and everyone is ready for a gripping battle on this hot, sweltering summer day. The feverish excitement is matched by the temperature of 90 degrees as the Australian captain, Richie Benno, tosses the coin for Peter May to call tails and call correctly for the fourth time in succession. May's decision to send Australia in staggers the critics and causes a buzz of animated conversation around the ground. In previous years, this Adelaide wicket has been noted for high scores, 
and the sight of the Mount Lofty Ranges in the distance revives the memory that Australia hit a post-war batting peak in 1954 when Hutton put Australia in in Brisbane and they made 600. With typical Adelaide gusto, the crowd welcomes Peter May and the England players as they come out on the field. Slow bowler Jim Laker is omitted from the final 11 and England is playing four fast bowlers with only Tony Locke to provide the spin. To face the imposing array of speed comes the Australian opening pair, Colin MacDonald and Jim Burke. They can expect a spirited new ball attack from Statham and Truman with Tyson and Bailey to follow. Due to the long period of dry weather, the wicket looks hard and even and should play easily. Why MacDonald is taking strike instead of an England player is an interesting question. But there he is, and play starts with Statham bowling. From any viewpoint, this is a bad way to start a test match. The chance doesn't affect MacDonald, who makes the most of his opportunities to open the scoring for Australia. Batsman cross for three byes, and Burke comes to the striker's end to face Statham, who is bowling to an attacking arc of eight men behind the wicket. A cover and a short leg are the only fieldsmen in front of the batsman as Statham comes in. The watchers see the score climb when Truman bowls his first over. The batsmen find it easy to play strokes on this plum pitch and the quick flow of runs makes it bright and entertaining cricket. McDonald's faulty stroke gives Truman food for thought but the fiery bowler will need more than his aggressive attitude to worry the batsmen in these conditions. McDonald takes a third run to bring the total to nine, scored off the first two overs. On comes Statham again, and this time it's Burke who maintains the scoring mood, and he sets off for more runs while Locke does the chasing. The three to Burke gives him the strike against Truman, and there's no luck here for Truman as Burke's outside edge keeps the score moving. Ball is fast losing its shine, yet Truman retains the attacking field in the hope of a breakthrough. Burke, with a hasty call, almost gives Truman his wish when the run out is just avoided. The excitement compensates the spectators, who are packed together in stifling conditions. However, the toiling bowlers are given no relief by the aggressive batsmen. This is the first boundary of the morning's play, and when the break for drinks is taken, Burke and MacDonald have scored their runs at the rate of almost one a minute. May brings Bailey into the attack to try and slow down the scoring rate. May and his senior players realize that run saving is of great importance, and they pin their hopes on Bailey to restrict the now adventurous MacDonald. Well-made plans here go astray through an indiscretion in the field by May himself and the batsman cross for a single. There's a double change when May calls on Tyson to bowl his first over of the match. 
May takes a lot of care setting a tight defensive field for the new bowler. In comes the bounding Tyson and MacDonald is able to force him away for a single to bring up Australia's 50. The crowd is kept in good humour when Tyson's bowling becomes the target for some forceful stroke play from a McDonald who is quickly reaching top form. In direct contrast, Tyson is more menacing when bowling to Burke and it's almost a catch behind. Umpire McGuinness rules it came off Burke's forearm, but it must have been close. Burke seems to have lost touch for a moment, and the fast bowler, sensing a possible wicket, sends down a faster ball, and Burke is wrapped on the pads. It's not out, much to Gravener's disappointment, and the players leave the field for the luncheon adjournment, with Australia none for 58. Back on the field, May calls on Locke to open the bowling after the 40-minute adjournment. The left-hander, with his nagging, persistent length, could be able to keep Burke and his partner quiet, although the wicket at this stage is not expected to take spin. Straight away, Locke succeeds in putting the batsman on the defensive. The pace of the game slows down, and in the next 40 minutes, the accurate bowlers are able to restrict the scoring to the occasional single. This powerful cut by MacDonald is the first sample of real aggression since lunch and it takes MacDonald's own score to 50 as the ball beats the field to reach the boundary. This brings about a quickening of tempo and Locke's bowling comes in for some severe punishment by the Australian opener. Another boundary to McDonald takes the Australian score to 100, the first century partnership by opening batsman in the series. McDonald is outpacing Burke and goes further ahead as Bailey comes into the attack. Donald's vigorous batting is making things hot for the bowlers and fieldsmen and the crowd's enthusiasm almost reaches boiling point when the medium pace bowler entices Burke to miss hit a catch to Cowdery in the gully. Burke is out for 66, his best effort of the series so far. The England players are pleased about the dismissal and it's congratulations to Bailey from Captain May. But they waited a long time for this wicket because Burke and McDonald put on 171, only nine short of the Australian opening record. This single to McDonald brings up his hundred, the first of his career against England. The England captain congratulates McDonald, who's having an outstanding season. He reached his century late in the day, and the final over by Statham is bowled to Neil Harvey, who takes advantage of the weary opposition by scoring some quick runs. Harvey takes two off the last ball of the over and the Australian total has reached 200. The players leave the field at stumps on the first day with Australia in a sound position and for Peter May, the scoreboard must be a dismal sight. Saturday, another day of high temperatures and low scoring in the morning session as the batsmen hesitate to force the pace with their team in a commanding position. In the 90-minute session, only 68 runs are added and Bert Nicholas with his camera has little to record until after lunch when Norman O'Neill comes to the wickets in place of MacDonald who retired hurt with an injured leg.
O'Neill faces Tyson, and a no ball is a welcome treat to the start of an inning. Australia's two best forcing batsmen are together, and they have a good chance of building up a mammoth score against the tired bowlers. With the score approaching 300, May's decision to field seems to have left his, te his team out on a limb. Then the unexpected happens. Bailey is bowling to O'Neill, a ball on the leg stump is turned to mid-wicket and the batsmen take a single. They go for a foolish second run, a good return to Bailey, the wicket is broken and Harvey is run out. <laughs> Harvey is out for 41 and the scoreboard shows Australia's sound position. Then there's tremendous applause from all parts of the packed ground as South Australian Les Fappel arrives at the wicket. O'Neill has the strike, and a typical cut sends the ball speeding towards the fence with Tyson in pursuit. The batsmen take two and start off on a third before Tyson reaches the ball to cut off a boundary. Three to O'Neill gives Fappel the strike. Everybody except the England players wants him to score as Bailey comes in. Babel has scored his first run, and from the remaining balls of the over, both batsmen play scoring strokes of a style reminiscent of their long stand in the third test match in Sydney. Promising start, but the crowd's hopes of a big partnership are dashed by one ball from Statham. A disappointed Pavel is out for four, and the third wicket has fallen. The scoreboard is still very pleasant reading from the Australian point of view, as Queenslander Ken Mackay arrives at the wickets. He is ready for Statham, and the first ball he receives gives him the opportunity to score his first run. Statham's last ball is a bumper, and O'Neill, after seeing the ball sizzle past his head, walks towards the dressing room, and he signals for a cap for protection against the sun, and probably against Statham as well. As Mackay is taking guard, we cross to the ringside, where the middleweight championship of the Adelaide Mound is in progress. While this vigorous exercise is taking place, the Australian 12th man, Keith Slater, tries to find suitable headwear for O'Neill. O'Neill is not satisfied with the selection of three caps, and Peter May kindly offers an England cap, which O'Neill graciously declines. Slater returns to the dressing room, as the new champion is taken to a different kind of dressing room under special escort. Play starts again with Bailey bowling, and both batsmen play some scoring strokes to make up for last time. Good length ball stops the scoring and it's the end of the over. While the players are changing over, O'Neill walks away from the wicket to meet Keith Slater, cap in hand. This time the cap fits and O'Neill wears it. O'Neill's push to cover is worth a single off the first ball of Statham's over and at least one spectator can look back on excitement when Statham gets Mackay to snick a catch to Evans. Mackay pauses and then walks off before the decision is given, out for four after batting for 20 minutes. A 
great recovery by the England bowlers and fieldsmen who have combined to dismiss three Australian batsmen for the addition of only 18 runs. Statham's success causes May to bring Truman into the attack and Benno meets his first ball with a virile hook that takes Australia's score to 300. O'Neill starts to attack, and this spell by Locke proves to be the most expensive of the innings. O'Neill playing strokes is good to watch, and in this knock he looks confident against all the bowling. His score rises quickly, and with shots like this one, he reaches his third 50 of the series. Lock comes off, Truman comes on, and Benno starts to match his partner with some power play. This is the fastest scoring of the day, with runs coming at the rate of one a minute. Benno and O'Neill put on 75 runs in quick time before the crowd sees an example of Statham at his best. O'Neill bowled by Statham for 58, yet another good innings by this young player. Norman O'Neill leaves the scene and then Truman comes into Davidson who begins in fine style. A feature of this Australian team is that a batsman with Davidson's ability has to bat number eight. Benno, too, is a bowler with great batting capabilities, and by the way the game is shaping, the rapid flow of boundaries could demoralise an ordinary player. However, a bowler with the skill of Truman is hard to overawe. Benno clean bowled for 46, a 46 which included seven boundaries. After this bright and entertaining knock, he leaves the field and passes on the way some England players who are exhausted by the heat. Benno's dismissal means that six wickets have fallen with 400 in sight. Only five minutes remain before stumps, and in the last over the batsmen attempt to score the runs required. The single takes Australia to 399 as Locke comes in. Grouch with an on-drive beats the field, and the 400 is reached. Batsman run for, and at stumps on the second day, Australia is six for 403. After a day's rest, Truman is fresh and fit on Monday morning, and in his second over, Grout is out, leg before wicket. After only four runs were added to the overnight score. Grout, the seventh batsman dismissed, scored nine runs, and he's replaced by Colin McDonald, who comes out with Jim Burke to act as runner. In comes Truman bowling to McDonald and the first ball is turned to leg for the runners to cross and McDonald has passed 150. Tyson comes on for another spell bowling to an attacking Davidson. It's another hot day but the Sunday break and the early wicket seem to have given the fast bowlers new life. After Davidson takes a second run he faces up again to the speedy Tyson and a good ball is played straight to the waiting hands of Bailey. <laughs> Davidson scored 43, and the veteran Ray Lindwall receives a tremendous ovation as he walks to the wicket. <laughs> Lindwall scampers off for his first run amid loud applause, and when Truman starts a new over, the popular player is among the runs again. The return is taken by Graveney, who's keeping in place of Evans, who fractured his little finger. Graveney doesn't figure in the McDonald run-out incident, which has become the sensation of the match. Burke attempting a quick single is given out by umpire Mel McGuinness. 
Seeing this, McDonald starts to move off towards the pavilion. Then he's stopped and advised by umpire McGuinness that he's not out. McDonald seems to be confused by this unusual happening, but because Burke passed behind the umpire's back, the decision was altered in favour of the batsman. Still not satisfied, McDonald moves back to the batting crease, and soon after, the intensely interested spectators see the surprise outcome of the incident. It's apparent that McDonald threw his wicket away. He scored 170 runs, and the crowd rises to applaud a great inning. Only three more runs are added to this score, and the players leave the field with Australia all out for 476. The innings took more than 12 hours actual playing time, and the critics agree that Australia is in a match-winning position. Even the weather favours the Australian players as they come out before the start of England's innings. The temperature is dropping quickly, and a cooling breeze has made conditions more pleasant as the England openers Peter Richardson and Trevor Bailey come out to bat. Both Richardson and Bailey were quickly dismissed, and in one hour's play, May and Cowdery held out a lively new ball attack to be still there at the tee adjournment. With only 48 runs on the board, England is not in a happy position. When play starts again, the speed of Lindwall has Cowdery in trouble, but a lucky outside edge is going to fall safe here. England moves to 50, and Rourke takes time off for some paper chasing. The cooling breeze has been freshening all the time, and is now blowing quite strongly. This wind can help Benno spin, and Cowdery is not very confident against the dropping ball. The single brings May against Benno, and a far more certain stroke is proof of the batsman's quality. Captain sends vice-captain off on a chase, and by the time Harvey can reach the ball, May has taken two. Then Cowdery finds his true form against Lindwall's bowling. This is a great improvement, but May and Cowdery will need the luck of a Chinaman to hold out the accurate bowling for long enough to put on the runs required to stave off defeat. May is batting well, and the Australian fieldsmen are getting plenty of exercise. This boundary takes him to 36, and while their captain is at the wickets, the England team is right in the game. Then the camera focuses on a sensation as Benno bowls. May bowl Benno for 37, and England's hopes fade with him. The Australians are overjoyed, and once again Benno has featured in a fine display of bowling. One captain has dismissed the other, and May leaves the field with his team facing the prospect of a follow-on. It's an ill wind that blows around the scoreboard from England's viewpoint. Tom Graveney arrives at the batting crease to play out Benno's over. He's intent on defence, and there's no run even though Rourke misfields. Stern defence is the main requirement, for England's position is as shaky as the marquee, which is in danger of collapse. The wind has now reached gale force, and it will accelerate Rourke's bowling. Cowdery is not worried by speed, and he scores off the first ball. Scoreboard, Graveney's first two runs go up, just as the marquee comes tumbling down. Fortunately, no one is injured because prompt action by the police and ground staff in clearing the area prevented any accidents. Attention comes back to cricket, with Benno bowling to Cowdery, and a handsome leg side stroke is a heartening sign for England.
Cowdery and Gravney are prepared to play strokes, and in this mood, they're an attractive pair to watch. In this case, it's beauty of a different kind when Gravney's drive sends the batsman off for three runs for England to pass the 100. Cowdery is getting most of the strike, and Lindwall welcomes the chance to bowl to Gravney, who's looking for every chance to pick up the regular single. This brings Cowdery to face Lindwall, and when a ball outside the odd stump is forced backward of point, Cowdery reaches 50. This single is scored off the last ball of the third day, and England is a long way behind with half the match over. Tuesday is another warm day, and play starts with Benno to Cowdery, and there's an exciting beginning to the morning's play. Two quick boundaries to Cowdery, and from the other end, Davidson shares the opening attack. Gravney, like Cowdery, is off to a good start. The batsmen are winning a lot of friends with their positive approach to a huge task. Even Benno, with his accurate length, can't restrain Cowdery, and the quick scoring shows that there are plenty of runs left in this easy-paced wicket. Cowdery's powerful stroke play and the resulting succession of boundaries causes Benno to make adjustments, and Mackay is moved to extra cover to cut off the drive. From then on, Benno is able to restrict the scoring. The batsmen are still trying to play shattering strokes, but their efforts are stumped by the defensive field. Runs come along slowly in this period, with neither Gravely nor Cowdery prepared to take risks. They wait for the loose ball, and when it comes, they take care of it in no uncertain way. This is test cricket at its best, and the densely packed crowd is enjoying the battle. They applaud Gravney and his partner as they pit their combined batting resources against the capable and accurate attack. Benno is trying to unsettle them by frequently changing his bowlers. And now it's O'Neill who comes in just before lunch. Cowdery takes full advantage of the change bowler in the last over before the adjustment. Lunch is taken, and the crowd can be satisfied with a good morning's play. No wickets have fallen, and the batsmen have added 55 runs to the overnight score. Full credit to the bowlers, too, for attacking the stumps all the time. After the 40-minute break, Cowdery takes guard, needing 16 for his century. And then the unexpected happens, with Rourke's first ball. Cowdery out for 84 after a grand fighting inning. He is the fourth batsman to be dismissed, and England looks certain to follow on as Benno bowls his leg breaks to the confident Gravney. Three runs to Gravney takes him to 41. Rourke starts a new over, and the first ball is turned to Benno at short leg, and Gravney's out caught. A great effort by Rourke, who's taken two vital wickets in two overs. Once again, the Australians have broken through in the early overs after lunch, and when Truman comes in, Benno bowls to Watson, who gets amongst the runs straight away.
single to Watson gives Truman the strike against Benno. From the very first ball, Truman is beaten completely and is caught and stumped for good measure by Keeper Grudge. Truman failed to score, and three quick wickets have fallen while ten runs have been scored. Truman leaves the scene, and Benno continues his over to the new batsman, Tony Locke. Batsmen take two runs as Harvey fields. Locke has retained the strike, and this time a rank long hop is mishit for keeper Grout to take a clever catch. Locke is out for two, and seven wickets have fallen. Frank Tyson plays his first ball straight back to Benno, and another wicket has gone to the slow bowler. Benno has now captured three cheap wickets in a great spell of bowling. Godfrey Evans comes into bat suffering from a fractured finger. He faces Benno and the crowd gives him encouragement when he scores off the first ball. The boundary is Evans' only scoring stroke and he's out caught off Benno's next ball. The crowd applauds the courageous Evans as he leaves the wicket, the ninth England batsman to be dismissed. England is still 288 runs behind as Statham joins Watson. Now the batsman must attack the bowling, and when Benno tosses the ball up, Statham uses the long handle to good effect. The batsmen aren't concerned about protecting their wickets in this tenth wicket stand, and they throw their bats at everything that comes along to quickly take the score to 200 and beyond. Statham in particular is battering the bowling, and runs are coming at a fast rate. Everyone, except the Australian bowlers, is enjoying this last-ditch stand, which is confusing the fieldsmen, as well as the experts. Slater has a long chase, and the batsmen take three more runs before the fieldsman is able to cut off the ball. Then Statham pounds Benno with a series of workmanlike strokes. Nathan and Watson race to their 50 partnership when the boundary is signalled. The crowd is delighted by the light-hearted display, but Rourke, in serious mood, puts an end to the innings by bowling Watson. Watson made 25, and Statham remained 36 not out. The players leave the field with England all out 240. Benno decides to enforce the follow-on, and the England openers this time are Richardson taking guard, and Watson, who's just been dismissed. England can only hope for a drawn game as Lindwall opens the attack. Richardson, ignoring the state of the game, uses a positive approach to give his team a good start. score moves to seven when three buys are recorded. Good start doesn't alter the attacking field of Burke at Short Gully, with Benno and Mackay, who are in slips, next to Harvey, and Keeper Grout. The other fieldsman, who is stationed close to the wicket, is MacDonald at leg slip, as Lindwall bowls here to Watson. Eight runs come from Lindwall's over and then Rourke, with a good exhibition of pace bowling, keeps Watson on the defensive. Watson playing cautiously last the new ball period, and England has made its best start of the series. He and Richardson have waited for their opportunities, and when they come along, they play attacking strokes to keep the score rising steadily. They take no real risks, and by stunts on the fourth day, they've added 43 runs. On Wednesday, Davidson opens a grim session with an occasional attacking stroke to lighten the tense atmosphere.
this is the only boundary of the morning, and at lunch, Watson and Richardson have added 34 runs. After lunch, Benno comes on, and Watson attacks. This is the danger period for England because this team is notorious for batting collapses in the early afternoon. Off Benno's next ball, Watson tries to repeat the stroke, but he skies the ball to Favell and he's out for 40 after batting for three hours. Another wicket to Benno, who's been a dominating figure in this match. The new batsman is captain Peter May. May attacks Benno from the outset, and his forceful play indicates that he intends to hit his team out of trouble. sequence of boundaries takes England past the century and the excitement hungry spectators are being satisfied. They react in typical fashion when Benno tricks Richardson and the left-hander is out leg before wicket. Richardson made 43, his best test innings of the series. May is joined by Cowdery and the new batsman faces the speed of Lindwall. Cowdery is away to a good start, but the crowd's hopes of a repetition of his first innings are dashed by a vintage ball from Ray Lindwall. Cowdery is out for eight, and England, at three for 125, faces an innings defeat. However, Australia and Benno still have to contend with the power stroking of Peter May. May is scoring at a furious rate, and he passes 50 in quick time. He's hit eight boundaries, and Benno counters with Rourke to try and restrict scoring. Graveney is taking strike now, and he's able to score his first run. Rourke starts to move in on his short run, and a faster ball traps May right in front. In the press room, the news of England's disaster is flashed around the world. May is out for 59. Another shock comes when Lindwell bowls the last ball of the day's play. Bailey shaping to glance, snicks, and Grout takes the catch. Bailey's out for eight. At stunts on the fifth day, England with five wickets in hand is still 38 runs behind the Australian total. England still has a slim chance to save the match on the final day. There are five hours play remaining, and stubborn defence is needed to hold out the attack. The Australians have a great chance to force a win and recover the ashes. The only policy for Benno is one of relentless attack, and he sets an aggressive field for the opening over. Play starts with Davidson bowling to Graveney. Score opens with a leg by as Rourke fields. This brings Truman against Davidson. The left-hander moves the ball away from Truman, who snicks, and Grout takes a brilliant catch. Truman failed to score and six wickets have now fallen. Lindwell moves in from the other end, and Graveney, with a confident drive, indicates that he'll worry the Australians before the day is over. O'Neill, in this case, is the fieldsman, and the boundary means that Graveney has lost the strike. Rourke takes advantage when he bowls to Locke. Locke is out for nine, and England is still 14 runs behind Australia with three wickets in hand. Rourke bowls to the new batsman, Frank Tyson, who surprises by showing unexpected fight. The quick burst of scoring puts England in the lead, and from the first ball of Lindwell's new over, Graveney forgets defence for a moment, and he turns the ball to leg to score his first runs in 20 minutes. When the batsmen take a second run, Graveney has reached his 50. Graveney's batting has helped England's long-range plan of a draw, but Benno dashes all hopes in another good bowling spell. A snick from Tyson to Grout and the eighth England wicket has fallen. Things look grim from the English viewpoint now, and the Australian supporters have cause for celebration when Benno entices Statham to have a big hit. The ball soars from the bat 
and O'Neill gets under it to take the catch. The injured Evans is the last batsman. He comes in to face Davidson, whose first ball is edged to Benno, and England is all out. Raveney remained not out 53 after five long hours of stubborn defence. The outstanding Australian bowler was Benno, who finished with four for 82 of 29 overs. He was well supported by Davidson, two for 17, Lindwall, two for 70, and Rourke, two for 78. The England innings finished 40 minutes before tea, and Australia needs to score 35 runs to win the match and the Ashes. Play starts with Statham bowling to Favell, and the first ball beats Bat, Stumps and Keeper to go through for buys with Dexter in pursuit. The ball beats Dexter to the fence, and from the next Statham delivery, Favell scores the first runs of, off the bat. At every vantage point, the spectators are hushed and silent in anticipation of every ball. Then loud applause as Burke scores his first run. By T, 17 runs have been scored. After the adjournment, Locke is brought into the attack and his first ball has Burke in trouble. As Locke reacts, the batsmen scamper through for more runs while the ball rolls towards the long boundary. This is a rare sight in any cricket if you count the number of times the batsmen cross. They ran five runs then, and in the stand, the battery of cameras are ready for the end. Cowdery bowls with three runs needed, and Burke makes it two by taking a single. Now the crowd sits silent, ready to roar when the winning run is scored. Fourth test match has been played and won. Australia, in winning by 10 wickets, wins back the Ashes, held by England since 1953. Yes, there really is something special about an Ashes tour, and you can follow all the action from the current Ashes series with ball-by-ball -ball coverage of every match, live and uninterrupted, on ABC Local Radio. Join Jim Maxwell and the ABC team.